So today, the news is Bitcoin, we saw rally big yesterday. It looks as though the miners are backing this software development at the so-called Segwit 2X. Good that Bitcoin's not going to split? Good for the ecosystem? It's great. It just shows the resilience of things. And we took it down to the wire, but it looks like Bitcoin's healthy and strong and its future is very bright. Future's very bright of Bitcoin. Talk to us more about the landscape then. ICOs, initial coin offerings, mm -hmm. going through the roof. The numbers are phenomenal. Seven to 800 cryptocurrencies now exist. Seven back in, what, 2013 has now, and more than 800 nowadays. Raising of, on, on ICOs is now up six times in the last year. You say, interestingly, this is a ticking time bomb. Why? Yeah, so uh, the fundamental problem with ICOs is, well, they're magical because they create liquidity and they allow people who have never been able to raise capital capital before to do so, uh, they have caused some people to forget that basic business principles, due diligence, these types of things don't go away because we have new technology. It reminds me of the, the dot-com boom and bust in a certain respect where they say, oh, it's a new technology and paradigm, so we don't really need to make profit or, you know, you know care about governance or these types of things. So I see a lot of similarities in this respect and I get a little worried that people are raising a bit too much too quickly and they haven't thought about the implications or consequences of it. Implications being eventually regulators catch on to this? Well that could be one but the other is just too much money can be just as bad as having too little money. You don't execute any faster but you now have much stronger expectations and a, a much uh, more aggressive group of investors. Uh, the other side of it is that salaries go up, your negotiation leverage goes down with people. Everybody knows you have 200 million, so yeah, maybe I get 25,000 a month or something like that. As for regulators, uh, it is certainly a concern. You have things like the SEC, you have FinCEN, you have the IRS, and every single one of them have an opinion about what these things ought to be, and at some point they have to make that opinion public and start enforcement actions in some respect. And does that come to haunt people? The ICOs that we've already seen come out, what mm -hmm. are, who, if regulation does come in post your ICO, who does that affect? The investor base or indeed the company that raised the money to begin with? Both, because from the investor base side, the tokens, if they're securities, may be delisted, so they lose liquidity. So these tokens that used to have a lot of value will lose the value on trading and also they become difficult to sell. Then on the business side, they may lose their bank accounts, they might force, you know, face some sort of civil issue or criminal issue. It just depends on uh, what representations were made, how much capital they raised, uh, where they're at, the people they raised the capital from. It's it's kind of a snowflake situation. The people they raise the capital from, who are the investors? I mean, of course, the joy of blockchain is that you can't tell, but right. is it is it generally those that have won out with the right. early Bitcoin and Ethereum successes? Well, you know, that's one of the problems. They're not doing KYC and AML, so you actually don't know who these people are or where the money's coming from. I would speculate that uh, a lot of the people are people who got tremendously lucky with Bitcoin and Ethereum, where they put some money in and all of a sudden they wake up and now they're millionaires. So they say, boy, let me see if I can do it again. Uh, so it's kind of fast ma money chasing even faster money in that respect. Is it real money? Are people cashing in and making this? How liquid is it if you own Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, or the other 800 cryptocurrencies they are? How easy is it? Uh, it's, it's tremendously easy compared to where it used to be just a few years ago. You can sell millions of dollars OTC, you can use ATMs, there's even a, something called a Zappo card where you can put Bitcoin on it and spend it, uh, and merchant gets paid in pounds or dollars, you're spending in Bitcoin. So liquidity has definitely improved over the last uh, few years. And uh, there's actually a recent ICO called BATS, where I they liquidated the vast majority of the money that they uh, they raised as a hedging strategy so that they wouldn't expose <laughs> They didn't them. buy into their own their own well, uh, steadiness of well, price to, either. To be fair to them, it was more like a value transfer mechanism to say we're going to raise the capital, but they have a fiduciary responsibility to be conservative and not be currency speculators. So paint to us the time bomb. What, what happens to this ecosystem up to 2020? Do we see sell-off, do we see implosion, but then rising from the ashes? Where does this go? Just like the dot-com boom. Some people go away, some people stay. Uh, it's hard times for a little while. Uh, the regulatory landscape changes a little bit. Uh, the bad actors tend to, to face some sort of recourse, and we move on. Uh, but this doesn't in any way stop what this field has unlocked, which is a completely new way of looking at reputation and identity and value and trust, uh, and the ability to move money anywhere in the world instantaneously, which is something we haven't had uh, ever in the entire history of the human race. What's, therefore, 
the end goal here. How do you see this affecting real people's lives? Those out there who are like, I just can't be bothered to get my head around really what Bitcoin is. I, right. Cryptocurrencies I'm hearing of, but how will it affect me in my real life? How will it? If it works in the Western world, it shouldn't impact you explicitly. It's more like VoIP. You know, everybody was saying one day we're going to talk to each other, you know, in video calls, and, and that was the future, right? Mm. Then all of a sudden Skype came around, and it just organically creeped up, and now it's in everything, right? You can use Facebook Messenger, these other things. So uh, from the Western world, we'll just see settlement and clearing get faster. So you send a wire transfer, and it takes 15 seconds. Transactional costs go down. When you go uh, buy something abroad and you spend dollars and they get euros, the cost of that transaction goes down tremendously. So you'll see, in my view, iterative improvement, which will lower cost of compliance and these things. In the developing world, on the other hand, I think it's actually a completely new financial system, something that runs on a cell phone, something that runs parallel to the banking system, and for the first time ever opens up remittances, microcredit, and a litany of other things that uh, are tremendously beneficial and allow them to build real wealth that also can't be taken by bad jurisdictions from them.